well-deserved praise here on the scientific forum so far uh, to Director General Grossi uh, from one of our guests in the panel that we will be coming to shortly. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the closing session of this year's scientific forum. We have heard some very compelling arguments for nuclear's role as part of a clean energy mix. And we've also heard a number of speakers telling us why that role needs to increase. We've talked about nuclear in conjunction with renewable sources and how important that is. And we've also talked about what some of the challenges are that countries face as they look to include a larger share for nuclear and how the International Atomic Energy Agency can help them meet those challenges. So in this final closing session, we want to hear from the Director General about his, uh, his thoughts and takeaways, and we also will be hearing from a very outstanding range of speakers who are with us today, both live in person and virtually. So I'm just going to briefly introduce them uh, in alphabetical order before we come to Director General Grossi uh, for a few uh, first thoughts uh, for this opening session. So very great pleasure to welcome, I hope we'll see him in just a moment on the big screens, Mr. Bernard Bigot. He is the Director General of the ITER organization it's, uh, it has, is a unique uh, fusion science and research facility, and it represents, there he is, welcome, sir. It represents a key milestone for the future of energy, namely safe, economically sound, environmentally friendly. And uh, he is with us virtually. It's great to have, us with, have you with us, Ben Abigo, and we will come to you in a little while uh, for a Q&A, for a dialogue. And I'm also very pleased to welcome with us here live in person uh, in the hall is Kirsty Gogan. She is co-founder of Energy for Humanity and also managing director at Lucid Catalyst. And as always, it was very important for us to hear the voices of civil society and youth. And you represent both of those, so great to have you with us. <laughs> and we, we look forward to coming back to you shortly as well uh, with our dialogue. And finally, I'm very pleased to welcome also joining us online Fabricia Pinheiro. She is a member of the board of directors of the International Youth Nuclear Congress. And uh, as I said, she too is here to represent civil society and the voices of young people. So great that you can be with us as well. Fabricia, welcome. And I'd like to just start out uh, by going straight away to the Director General to hear your thoughts uh, about, I know you couldn't be with us for all of your sessions, but I also know that you've got eyes and ears in the room. So perhaps you can just share a few of your key thoughts, then we'll go to our panel to uh, answer a few questions and then come back to you at the close. Well, thank you very much. Like you say, um, I've been following with uh, a lot of attention what's been going on here and, uh, and online. Uh, I, I think uh, the array of, of views and perspectives has been simply impressive. Um, some, some, some of the inputs uh, um, left me thinking, really of uh, some of the issues we, uh, we have been working on, we are going to be working on after the, uh, the lights are off and we go back to the, uh, to the work, um, to the normal work at the agency. Uh, I must say that uh, there are a few important uh, uh, takeaways that uh, are emerging uh, quite clearly. Um, but uh, what I would uh, suggest, Melinda, is that uh, we keep this to the, for the end. Uh, we have um, this panel now, uh, some of them, uh, like uh, Monsieur Bigot, who is an old friend, uh, distinguished colleagues um, uh, I've been working with for, for uh, uh, many, many years, and uh, new friends um, like you and others who are bringing uh, new ideas. Uh, so perhaps uh, at the end of that, I will share with you some thoughts. So I look forward to get uh, to be able to uh, squeeze uh, from the panels a little bit more wisdom uh, before, uh, before I close. But uh, so far, I've been 
very, very encouraged by what I heard. I think we have been putting the right questions and getting some very, very, very uh, interesting answers. So uh, let me not uh, take the time away from, from the panelists and then I will perhaps share with you some ideas and maybe some questions, if you Thank allow me. Thank you very much. Then let's start right out by posing a few more questions. And I will indeed begin with Bernard Bigot, uh, if we can perhaps get him up on our screens. Um, and I introduced you, of course, as uh, a leader in the area of fusion. And fusion does hold the promise of carbon-free, limitless, safe energy. And of course, there have also been advances, yet I think all experts acknowledge it is going to be a while till we see uh, fusion truly become uh, a real part of the energy mix. But meanwhile, you also have a background in nuclear fission. So let me come to you and ask about your takeaways, your most important messages when it comes to the deployment of nuclear fission power and nuclear innovations that can be useful and employed to really uh, develop and also deploy fusion in the future. So thank you very much for inviting me to participating to this uh, forum. Uh, unfortunately, I could not be with you today, but uh, we follow uh, your works definitively. Definitely also, as you know, fission and fusion are two different technologies, really different, certainly, but they could be very much complementary. And from my point of view, there is a lot to learn from each other. The first, maybe, uh, I will say with the ITER project, is that we have been lucky enough to work with 35 different countries, which all agree to start with the same safety standard, which means that they adopt from the very early beginning of the development of this project, which will, I guess, will set the standard for the fusion development in the future, to agree on a common safety standard. And it could bring a lot of value, and I do believe that it will be very good also that fission consider more have largely distributed common standard. Second, even if uh, the conditions are very different, as you know, we will have a, a plasma, hydrogen plasma, 150 million degrees. Okay, we will be uh, with a very low density, the density which will one over one million, the density of the atmosphere. We will have a lot of, uh, of uh, neutron flux, very high uh, energy flux of neutrons. All this makes quite different from the fission. But uh, you have a lot to learn about material, about okay, uh, ITER uh, information and control, about uh, all this uh, uh, robotics uh, uh, issue we have. So I really believe that uh, we have to work together. Uh, we, for example, take full advantage now of the qualification of many of the equipment which are uh, already considered in the fission nuclear power plant. Uh, for example, the valve, for example, the actuators, and all these different uh, activities. So I advocate a lot to have a joint working uh, partnership. And indeed, it is precisely the case now in ITER benefiting uh, from all the contribution of the seven members. Thank you very much for that. And you, uh, you pick up there uh, on several points that, in fact, we have discussed uh, in our preceding sessions of the forum uh, with uh, your mention of uh, automation and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, something we have talked about uh, in a number of sessions, both in terms of uh, smooth integration of different sources in the clean energy mix, but also very much in terms of monitoring and safety. So that point there, clearly one that both fusion and fission could have in common, the role of AI. And your second, uh, or the, the thing that you uh, stressed first, of course, the considerations of safety have been an ongoing topic, uh, not only at this uh, forum, but also at past scientific fora, uh, not least because of the crucial role of public acceptance. And let me come to Kirsty Gogan on that point, because in fact, nuclear power, 
often still has a bad rap. Uh, public opinion not always favorable, often also misperceptions about nuclear. So what do you think can be done to dispel some of the myths? And how can the IAEA help to do that? Oh, and do we take your mic, if you would? Great question. Thank you. And th thanks so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. And I, it's just been a wonderful conference. So congratulations to everybody who's been involved. And I'm really happy to say that, you know, many of the sort of recommendations that I'd like to make, I've really seen in action here throughout the, the, the wonderful presentations and discussions. So really, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed, actually. Um, I would summarize um, the action that I, I would recommend that we take in three parts. Um, rigor, coalition building, and values alignment. So let's take each of those. So in terms of rigor, of course our industry is unparalleled in its rigor when it comes to technical performance, when it comes to quality assurance, when it comes to... Um, science and technology. And I think we could do more around being more rigorous in our communications. Because there is actually a wealth of science communication research out there that we could learn from and we could apply. And I'm starting to see that being applied. Um, but ultimately, the, the scale and urgency of climate change demands that we are evidence-based and rigorous in designing our solutions, in designing our future clean energy systems, and therefore we must also be rigorous in terms of our communication and in terms of our engagement. And I can give you some examples of that. And, you know, for example, we know that uh, myth-busting doesn't work, that what happens when you, when you restate a myth to somebody and then rebut it unless they already agree with you, the only thing that they remember is, is the myth being repeated back to them. So that's called the boomerang effect. So there's all kinds of very interesting research that we can, that we can apply. And for example, you know, constantly talking about safety reinforces the perception that, that nuclear is incredibly dangerous. Um, so then the second part is, is around coalition building. This is actually linked because we know the evidence tells us that the fastest and most feasible and actually most cost-effective way to decarbonize our energy systems is through a combination of nuclear and renewables. And we also know that from the evidence, all of the cons consistent public opinion polling in, in Europe and in the United States tells us that if you ask people, do you support nuclear as part of an energy, uh, do you support nuclear energy, you'll get generally around 40, 45% of people will support it. If you ask people, do you support nuclear and renewables as part of a clean energy mix, that will jump to 80, 85% support. So the evidence tells us that the combination of nuclear and renewables is popular. The evidence tells us that the combination of nuclear and renewables is the best fastest and most cost-effective way to deliver a clean energy system. So let's lead with that. And then finally, values alignment. So in terms of values alignment, and this is linked really to coalition building as well, um, you know, throughout the sort of 20, 25 years of successfully building public and political support for action on climate change, we haven't yet made a dent on the upward trajectory of emissions. And part of the reason for that is that we've, we've, within the larger climate and energy discourse, put too much emphasis, perhaps, on a limited set of technologies. And we've really successfully driven down costs and driven up rates of deployment for wind and solar. And now we need to do the same again for other clean energy technologies. And in order to do that, we need to, co we need to reach out to other successful industries and take that success template, not only from, from the renewable sector, where they've demonstrated how um, consistent deployment, sustained access to finance, a commitment to cost reduction, moving away from project-based approaches to product-based manufacturing can drive down costs and deliver incredible value. We need to apply that success template into the nuclear sector, but we can also learn from other industries as well. We can learn from shipbuilding, we can learn from, from other major industrial sectors, including the oil and gas sector, to really enable this technology to play the, the, 
to make the meaningful contribution that it has the potential for, not just in the power sector, but across heat and transport and industry as well. So I urge you to start implementing these recommendations because it's 2020, 30 years to 2050. Right. And we've been reminded time and again how long the lead times are on nuclear projects. Uh, many of uh, the points that you just made also reminded me of the opening words that we heard from Agneta Riesing in her presentation when she said, you know, if we know something works, we need to do it again and again and again. Take what works, scale it up, standardize it, because that's how we get uh, how we get to scale. Let me now go to, uh, to Fabricia Pinheiro, who's with us online. And uh, again, I said we wanted to hear young voices. And uh, interestingly enough, there are many young people who do apparently have support for what is essentially an old technology, namely nuclear. So I want to ask you why that is and what more can be done to inform young people in order to get them on board in terms of expansion of nuclear's mix, uh, nuclear share in the uh, clean energy mix. Thank you, Melinda, and thank you to the IAEA for always giving young generations a voice. I think that calling nuclear uh, an old technology may be a little bit of a misrepresentation. Um, yes, it is based on many years of development and innovation, and it probably takes a little bit longer than other industries um, because of uh, regulatory requirements. However, there are many innovative and exciting technologies that are related to small modular reactors, uh, fusion energy, such as the ITER project that Mr. Bigot was discussing, automation for remote operations, radio isotopes, and many more. Many of the young professionals who joined the workforce in the last 15 years, like myself, have not only joined it because of the remarkable scientific and technolo technological advancements within the industry. In fact, I think many of us have joined and remain within the industry because we know that our work has a direct positive impact on the world. I think it's the sense of pride and purpose that keeps us going. It is contagious and inspiring, and it's what organizations like the International Youth Nuclear Congress, or IYNC, which I am part of, aim to nurture so that more young people are committed to making it a stronger and better industry. A lot of the key messages that Kirsty just mentioned, actually, including the promise of an integrated industry with solutions not only for climate change, but for public health, are also extremely powerful. And I think they really resonate with younger generations. Everyone here to today plays a vital role in achieving this goal through engaging with, mentoring, and providing opportunities for, for the younger generation. So I think there are um, many different opportunities for us to continue to, to be involved, and it's organizations like the IAEA, that, like IYNC, and Women in Nuclear that can really have an impact in influencing that. Thank you very much, Fabricia, for sharing those thoughts. And I will now take all of these insights that we've just heard and uh, go back to the Director General and ask uh, for your thoughts on what you've heard and uh, if you like uh, also with specific remarks to the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, well, these uh, ideas, this um, uh, final, not because they, 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 they are the last word, it's just in the order of the program, um, point to um, a number of important uh, topics that have been discussed uh, before. Uh, and of course, the issue of uh, fusion, where uh, ITER is emblematic, uh, um, address uh, some of the um, approaches we have, been, we have been trying now. I think uh, my uh, conclusion uh, of the, the, the whole effort uh, of, of, of this forum uh, is that uh, uh, we are uh, putting the right questions. We are putting the right questions. We are trying uh, in a dispassionate way uh, with, I hope, rigor, 
to see w where is it that the bottlenecks uh, exist and what is that we, as, as the, the international hub for everything nuclear, but also the industry, uh, have to be uh, looking at and how uh, to do it better. I think that throughout the discussions, uh, the, of course, the issue of uh, innovation has come uh, again and again. Uh, and what we see is that uh, the industry is not stagnant when it comes to this. It is important to see that we are not um, simply reproducing a technological format or model that could be working, because they are. Uh, when you tour the world, as, as I have to, um, and you visit uh, different nuclear power plants and you see them, some of them fantastic machines working very, very efficiently uh, with technologies that date from uh, a few years, uh, you see that, they, that, the, uh, that the industry has not stayed um, with uh, the, the safe uh, in terms of economic value and return, not in terms of nuclear safety. And, and you see this constant uh, evolution. You've been discussing here, Generation 4, I think now SMRs uh, are at the risk of becoming a cliché, but uh, notwithstanding that, I think it is, it, is, it is clear that they are a reality there and there is, there is, there is a lot of interest. Uh, when we discuss, for example, with countries that are actively interested in uh, nuclear power, the so-called newcomers, and even a degree below that, those who are looking with real interest. I mean, we have all this categorization, as you know, with the milestones documents. You see them already themselves uh, wanting, demanding from the industry the SMR because they, they, they want nuclear power, they need nuclear power. They are convinced, they are. They know that this is a solution for them. And what is interesting is that this is coming from uh, different perspectives. In some cases, it is because um, they are longing for um, power um, as a strategic asset and they want independence, and they are dependent, um, and they fear this situation. We don't get into that, but we know that they recognize that this, is, this gives you an added value. You can decide what to do with your nuclear energy. You have your nuclear power plants. They are operating there for you, and they give you this, uh, um, uh, this great ability to scale it up, scale it down, work uh, independently of uh, sometimes political forces that are often, especially for middle-sized and small countries, beyond their ability to influence the great trends of history. So this is very important because uh, it, it's not a, uh, something that is there. It's a good to have for, for some. Um, or a way to uh, uh, continue producing nuclear energy in a more efficient way. So uh, here uh, the demand is there, and it, it's it's going to be it's going to be growing uh, quite clearly. Uh, I think that when it comes to so this is a very important area that has been discussed, and important um, aspects have been um, um, have been shown and have been described. Uh, the, the financing issue, also, we know it's, it's problematic, but it's not impossible. We see in some cases, in some parts of the world, including in Latin America, for example, where I come from, uh, that uh, regional development banks are starting to look into, for example, I can cite examples of uh, long-term operation of, uh, of reactors that have been financed through... Uh, uh, through uh, this, these lines of, of, uh, of multilateral credit that uh, until now seemed to be uh, a no-go zone or a restricted uh, area for them. I'm not saying that this is completely solved, but um, it, it, is going, uh, it is going to happen. So uh, the innovation is there. 
the uh, f financial um, uh, debate is one that needs to be, uh, of course, uh, done, uh, but uh, it's changing. Um, another uh, very important um, aspect, and I think it has also to do with some of the communication uh, challenges that we've had uh, historically, uh, is the issue of uh, waste, where we also have uh, uh, very fine technological uh, uh, solutions and even examples uh, that we must be um, um, showing in, 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 in a very, I would say, assertive way. Uh, I was surprised um, just a few weeks ago to hear a very important European leader uh, that uh, confronted with a couple of pointed questions about a very drastic decision they had taken in that country with regard to uh, nuclear energy, uh, responded that, um, of course, um, nuclear had um, merits, but of course, uh, it was not sustainable because of the waste problem. So one sees, ironically, one sees that the argumentative uh, core is shrinking because really we are providing the answers and we need to continue to uh, provide the answers to, to show that uh, the, uh, the, the industry is uh, coming up with the necessary uh, solutions uh, there. Uh, of course, for me, uh, from the perspective of, of this institution, uh, I believe that uh, uh, we have an important role to play uh, in uh, ensuring that uh, the uh, discussion uh, and the societal acceptance, which is so sometimes difficult to reach, uh, can have a firmer basis to be supported. And, and uh, we can, through the normative underpinnings that we provide uh, through uh, safety, through security, uh, we are the ones that can add this uh, unique uh, value. There are occasions in which countries, and this is normal, uh, do have different views on certain things and sometimes even discussions about the uh, activities that they are carrying out and that could have transboundary um, effects. Uh, but when the IAEA is involved, the moment we show the, the blue flag of the IAEA in these projects, some of them quite controversial, regionally speaking, and I don't want to mention concrete cases, but we can think about some of them, then it is clear that there will be uh, an impartial approach, that there will be a scientific um, uh, contribution that is going to make sure that when there is a problem with safety, there is a problem with how uh, waste uh, in whatever form it can present itself uh, is there. Uh, we are going to be there reminding or applying the norms as they, um, as they should be applied. I think, uh, Linda, we are entering an interesting phase. We are facing um, uh, Glasgow, where the agency is going to be present. Hopefully, I'm trying to reach out to the industry, to other um, um, organizations, um, and we are going to be there presenting a very united and hopefully eloquent uh, case so that uh, uh, this issue can be treated uh, in the way it should be. We should not expect magic solutions. This is not going to be something that is going to change from one day to the next. Uh, but I think we have to uh, be constant and persevere. Uh, in these efforts. Through dialogues like this, listening to views like yours and others who are telling us how you see it, um, and us as well, interacting with, with all the stakeholders, with the companies in country, with countries individually, uh, to uh, 
promote this issue. Why? Simply because it is a good solution. It is a solution that brings uh, uh, energy, that helps development, that takes care of our planet. So uh, all the elements are there. But of course, uh, um, we uh, need to uh, face the debates, to face the challenges, and to respond with, like you say, with rigor, uh, with calm, but also with determination. I'm very grateful for the opportunity that the, this forum has uh, provided us to uh, address these issues, to uh, present to all participants the state of the art in the different uh, areas that you were discussing. And uh, I was so impressed with the quality of the people who were talking, uh, looking uh, as I was following your, your debates um, uh, on very quite technical debates that you were uh, moderating on, on some uh, technical solutions and, and, and technical problems. So I think this has added uh, something. Uh, we know more than we did a couple of, year, of days ago, a couple of days ago, and uh, we will continue with, with the same determination. So I'm very happy to have, have had this opportunity um, and, and to continue uh, our work. You know, one thing, Thank you. one thing that certainly strikes me when you think about the path to Glasgow and how important Glasgow will be next year is uh, that what we could really see here at this scientific forum is that certainly this sector, nuclear power, has come out of the silo. Because we've been talking again and again about nuclear share in the overall mix, that systemic perspective that's been emphasized here by so many speakers, I think, is absolutely crucial if we want to try to address the climate crisis in a meaningful way. So maybe just one thought uh, on that score before we wrap it up here. I think it's indispensable. It might not be comfortable because of what you were mentioning and, and, and your replies uh, on that. It hasn't been comfortable in the past and still, uh, and still it, it isn't. Uh, but uh, uh, a, a problem of the dimensions uh, we, we, we have in, in front of us in terms of the post-pandemic recovery, in terms of the damage we are inflicting uh, to our environment are, are so huge that there is no other way but to uh, continue uh, providing the answers and um, I would say uh, confronting all these issues uh, squarely and head on. Um, uh, and I can see uh, uh, there's a recognition uh, uh, of this. Uh, we, we can see, we certainly see in every paper and even in the general press that uh, um, the, the contribution of nuclear uh, is seen um, as logical. Perhaps they are whispering it, but hopefully if we continue, they will say it a little bit louder. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful closing words for this Scientific Forum 2020. Then it only remains for me to say a very, very warm thank you. I'll start with our online audience who've been following us uh, for some very demanding presentations. You've posed great questions. We're so grateful for your attention. Of course, the warmest of thanks also to all of those who made the trip to be with us here live in person in Vienna. It's great to see this room socially distanced and yet still, you know, uh, almost a third full or a half. So that's wonderful. And thank you so much for being with us and also for your attention and contributions as well. And of course, as always, the very warmest thanks to the organizational team. This forum with this hybrid format is probably the most difficult thing there is to do in the event business. So we can give them, I think, a very warm round of applause. Also to all the technical staff, camera, sound, <laughs> online. Thank you.
And Director General, I wish you all the best for the wi further efforts and, uh, and thank you very much that we could all be part of the Scientific Forum 2020. Thank you very much.